Good evening and welcome to the webinar, PMDD Myths and Misconceptions. Thank you for joining us. My name is Ariana Di Florio. I'm Professor of Psychiatry at Cardiff University in Wales, where I lead the Clinical and Research Programme in Women's and Reproductive Mental Health. First, I would like to introduce uh, to you our panel of experts. First, Catherine Hopkins and Ellie Short who are working behind the scenes, providing technical support to this webinar. Good evening, Catherine and Ellie. Then Chloe Atsi will give a brief overview of the menstrual cycle and PMDD. Good evening, Chloe. I'm then delighted to introduce Laura Murphy. Laura has agreed to share with us her lived experience of PMDD and will provide a stakeholder perspective to the discussion. Hi, Laura. Hi, thank you for having me. We have received a lot of great questions in advance and during the webinar we will have the opportunity to ask more questions in the Q&A box. Sandy McDonnell will help answering the question with her great wisdom and experience. Good evening Sandy. Good afternoon for you probably. <laughs> uh, we cannot guarantee that all questions will be answered during the webinar but we will do our best to answer as many as possible. If you wish to ask any questions, please note that unfortunately we are unable to answer any questions regarding individual health circumstances. This is because of legal and ethical guidelines. This webinar will include a discussion of suicide and reference to mental disorders and their symptoms, which some people might find disturbing. I will warn you ahead of the discussion on suicidality if you wish to take a break. So um, thank you for joining us this evening and thank you Kat for introducing me. Um, as mentioned by both Kat and Ariana, um, my name is Chloe Apsi and I'm a psychology assistant at the National Centre of Mental Health here in Cardiff. Um, I'm just sort of, I work on the PREDICT project that we've got going on, which is a genetic study of PMTD, which I think Ariana is going to talk about a little bit later on. Um, but I'm here today just to sort of give you a brief like primer on PMDD but based off the Mentimeter I don't think I need to go too much detail about everything so let me just share my screen okay. so um yeah I'm going to keep this a really brief overview as obviously some of you are quite familiar with the topic already but also because um, between Ariana and Laura, everything's going to hopefully be covered in a bit more detail. Um, so just to kind of get started, I wanted to talk very briefly about the menstrual cycle itself. Obviously, it's a key factor when we talk about premenstrual dysphoric disorder. So in terms of um, the menstrual cycle itself, as many of you may know, it lasts on average about 28 days and there's two key events. There's ovulation, which is when the egg is released from the ovary, and there's the menstrual bleeding. Um, the triggering and stopping of these um, events tend to be managed by hormones. So the key hormones we're talking about um, in relation to PMDD anyway, and just the menstrual cycle in general, is um, estrogen and progesterone. So the main two phases are the follicular phase, which is made up of the days from the onset of menstrual bleeding to ovulation, which is when the hormone progesterone is quite low. And then the hormone estrogen is slowly rising until it peaks just before um, ovulation. The phase that we're talking about when we talk about PMDD um, more relevant to is the luteal phase. So this is the days between ovulation and menstrual bleeding. And, um, it usually lasts about 12 to 14 days and it's characterized by high levels of progesterone and a second peak in estrogen, which then both fall just before the onset of um, menstrual bleeding or the period, which more commonly known. So the seven to 10 days at the end of the luteal phase are what we tend to refer to as the premenstrual phase. And this is the time where people with PMDD start to experience symptoms. Um, so the DSM-5 um, characterizes PMDD as um, a cyclical hormone-based mood disorder. The DSM-5, um, which Ariana will talk about a bit more about, is the sort of diagnostic manual for um, psychiatric disorders. Um, 
So as you can see on the slide, people with PMDD start to experience really severe mood and emotional changes during this premenstrual phase, the week or so before the onset of bleeding. Um, these symptoms appear during that phase. And then once the period starts, they start to subside. Um, these symptoms can have a really significant impact on daily functioning and people's personal lives. Um, so in order to be diagnosed with PMDD, you normally have to meet these three additional criteria. So the symptoms associated with a clinically significant distress and interferences with everyday life, um, obviously during that symptomatic phase, but also there's a lot of follow-up and many people say that they tend to spend the rest of the month catching up from the, that week. Um, disturbance is not just the worsening of a condition that you experience all the time, which again, Ariana is going to talk about a little bit more in detail. And in order to be diagnosed with PMDD, you normally have to go to the doctors who will give you a mood diary where you track your symptoms for two consecutive um, cycles. So who can experience PMDD? It's important to kind of note that PMDD can impact anybody who's at reproductive age and typically experiences a menstrual cycle. Um, so it's any person who's assigned female at birth, regardless of um, gender identity or any other factors. Um, unfortunately, there is limited research on PMDD for those who've been tr tr who are transitioning or have transitioned. So there is more information about this on the IAPMD website, but today a lot of the studies that we're going to be discussing are going to be um, are going to consist of participants who are assigned from at birth and identify as women. Um, so yeah, thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can put them in the Q and A box. But as I mentioned earlier, Ariana is going to sort between Ariana and all. There's going to be a lot more discussion to kind of cover the little gaps that I may have left. Um, so I'm going to pass you back to Ariana, who should introduce Laura and the rest of the topics. If I can stop sharing my screen. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Chloe, for the brilliant introduction. Uh, so, Laura, we said we were having a, a chat. Um, okay. if you, it would be great if you could share with us your own experience with PMDD. So when did your symptoms start first start? Uh, so my symptoms started, looking back, I, I started suffering from um, sort of depressive symptoms and depression, um, which may or may not have been PMDD. I'm not sure there was stress at school and things, but definitely there was a day on when I was 17, when I'd started the contraceptive pill for um, heavy periods. And on day 21 of taking that pill, I stopped for the break. And on day 21, I don't know quite what happened, but um, obviously your hormone levels drop quite significantly when you stop taking it. And I literally just crashed and burnt, was hyperventilating, started having panic attacks, um, you know, really hit the floor. And then for about six months, quite consistently, I went into quite a deep depression. And then from then, um, I always knew I suffered from very severe PMS, like bad PMS. It was a bit of a running joke in my university household that, you know, I could get a bit scary and I knew I'd go to bed and I get a bit tired um, and angry and irritable and extremely, extremely down. But I didn't really link it to my cycle too much um it was just you know kind of written off as being a bit difficult and having bad pms um so yeah it wasn't for quite a few years really that um the penny kind of dropped that it was something actually a bit more significant and and is there anything that you think has worsened your symptoms when is that you realize that that this was pmtd um, so for me, when I had, um, when I was in my 30s, early 30s, I had the marina coil fitted, um, which if I'm honest, was kind of sold to me as, you know, the best thing on the earth, it will, you know, it will get rid of all your periods, it will get through all your issues. And I was kind of okay for a couple of years. And again, then I crashed and burnt, I suffered from I've never lived with anxiety. I've had panic attacks in the past. I've never had anxiety. And I had just the most extreme anxiety and suicide, suicidal ideation for 
18 months pretty much solid was very unwell I couldn't work I couldn't function day to day I had to move home um I was really poorly um and I was of course looking online as you do you know marina and depression and I'd seen some links and I you know been told by my doctor it's not connected there's no way the marina can affect someone that way um and it was only I started actually having counseling because I was so unwell um and it was my counselor um therapist for for people who are watching out of the UK um who kind of picked up on it and again I went to the doctor and again I said the PMS is you know it's it's really bad now like it's it's getting really dark before my period and I was told it's just PMS you know you need to learn to live with it every other woman lives with PMS you just need to learn how to cope with it like everyone else and it just so happened that that same day I went to go and I had an appointment with my therapist and she's the one that sort of said you know this isn't PMS like no matter what anyone is telling you I can tell you now <laughs> that this is this is not PMS this is not what everyone goes through and it was kind of through her actually she was so angry about what my doctor had said whereas I just accepted it for a long time and I really just thought it was me I really thought um I just couldn't cope with life like everyone else I thought I was seeing all my friends kind of move on and have relationships and have careers and have you know all these things and I honestly just thought um it's not going to be for me I'm I'm broken I can't cope with life like everyone else I can't keep a job I can't hold a job down I can't hold a relationship down um you know I can't get my foot on the ladder to do anything and um she was sort of so angry on my behalf which I'll never forget because she was the first person that was kind of like actually no 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 whatever you're going through this isn't standard and this isn't something you should have to to go through so it was that day that um I kind of went home and started googling again you know because <laughs> even like eight years ago you know didn't have internet on my phone had to go home and use the use the computer um to look up like you know PMS that makes you suicidal I think it was and I found um the old so the old IAPMD website which was the Georadman Foundation website and um yeah my it was kind of a revelation to me to be honest to to see as you know we hear this all the time people join groups and they look through the symptoms and it's like this light bulb moment where it's like oh my god that's me that's just makes sense of so much um and I joined some Facebook support groups um and that to me, I think, you know, that kind of peer support element was again, life changing because I was reading, I always, I always thought that I was just quite unique, <laughs> uniquely broken. Um, and it was just me. And then you read through all these stories of all these people that are having exactly the same experiences, having really quite severe reactions to, to birth control pills, um, which not everyone does, um, you know, losing relationships struggling to hold down work struggling to hold down consistent work um you know and having all the same sort of difficulties as me and that just was really a, a big a big thing for me and it took a long time to adjust to knowing that it was PMDD and having some answers but I think also it was really really validating to kind of see that I wasn't the only one going through it and the more people I, I meet with PMDD I know just how many similar stories there are you know I think my story isn't unique in any way whatsoever I speak to people all the time who've gone through exactly the same so I, th I think yes definitely Marina made it worse for me personally and also I think age um in my 30s once I had the marina removed even um and I got my cycle back my symptoms got a lot more severe and longer throughout the month um yeah once you got the diagnosis uh, mm -hmm. Laura, uh, what treatments were you offered um, so I sort of um, inadvertently had gone through a lot of the 
first line of um, treatment. So I'd been on antidepressants, SSRIs for a number of years already on and off. Um, and by that point, I decided with my doctor that actually I wanted to be on them long term and not keep coming off, um, which I was quite happy with because I do and did find they helped me. Um, I'd already tried a lot of the contraceptive pills and they hadn't worked for me. So by the time I got a diagnosis, I was under Dr. Panay in the UK, in London. Um, and I started um, the cycle suppression through hormone therapy. So that's kind of one step up from taking the um, contraceptive pill to try and flatten down your cycle. Um, unfortunately, that didn't work for me. It was a bit sporadic and, and hit and miss. And then I went on to chemical menopause uh, for nine months, which again was not very successful I ovulated through nine months of it um those ovaries did not want to shut down um and then eventually um so five years ago now I had the surgery for PMDD which is um both ovaries removed bilateral oophorectomy and I also had a hysterectomy in addition so that I didn't have to touch progesterone again was that an easy choice? I imagine it's quite a difficult procedure, a difficult choice. To make. Um, yes and no. I think it was easier for me because I think I'd already come to the decision that I, I didn't want to have children by that point. Um, I'd lost so many years that I kind of wanted some time back for myself um, and didn't want to start a family. I have a lovely stepdaughter. I'm very fortunate. Um, I think because I didn't have that fertility issue to think about, it was probably a bit easier for me. And if I'm honest, um, I don't know how much longer I would have made it without having that surgery. So for me, it kind of, it almost didn't feel like much of a choice. It kind of was at the point where I can't live like this anymore. I'm losing, you know, at that point, it was two weeks a month with extreme exhaustion at either end from you know, from going through it and getting them period flu, period flu, you know, at the end of each one, because my body was just so utterly wiped out. Um, so yeah, it, it kind of felt like a, a choice, but not much of one. It was literally the only thing left to try for me. Um, so yeah, it was, it's a roller coaster for sure. It was a, it's a, a difficult one. Thank you so much, Laura. This this is really helpful, I think. Also, so somebody in the chat put um, the about um, talk talks about the importance of raising awareness among medical professionals. So not only people with lived experience. So really, thank you. I think this is really helpful to many people. Uh, it must be difficult to share, but I'm sure that's really important. And I appreciate it's it. It's okay. I think I think it's it's. It's so important because hearing people talk about it makes people feel less alone. And I think, you know, we always say like suicide, sorry, PMDD awareness is suicide prevention because it is, you know, to, to come and be part of a community and have people that understand and have information and resources. It's just, it's just life changing. So yeah, I don't have any problem about talking about it because I think um, it's going to help other people in the end. I see some questions for you also mm -hmm. in the in the chat, not only in the Q and A. Um, do, you, do you want to answer to those now, Laura? Yeah, I will. I think I will answer to those um, as as you are doing your presentation. Let's have a look because I need to copy and paste some information. Um, I'll just answer um, someone in the chat bar how long I'd had symptoms before surgery so I was 37 when I had my surgery and I'd started having proper symptoms at 17 so 17 years of those years I was undiagnosed um and then for three years I was diagnosed before I had my surgery so it was 20 years in total living with it um and someone asked if the marina is an IUD yes it's uh um it is a progestin Sorry. Do make sure if you're ask, if you're um, wanting to share something in the chat bar that you're sharing it to everyone, because otherwise only the host can see it and um, you'll get you'll miss. But yes, the the marina coil is a is a IUD. Thank you, Laura. So um, 
Shall we now discuss together, you and I, Laura, uh, a bit about some myths and misconceptions we, we, we selected from the many? Yes, yeah, that's great. So, um, we decided for this webinar to select the most common myths and misconceptions on PMDD based on our experience and organize them around five themes or questions ranging from uh, diagnosis to treatment and from research to clinical practice. From the poll we ran at the beginning, I see you're all really already familiar with probably most of these concepts. So really this is more a discussion and a moment of reflection um, for us all on these topics. So the first, um, the first question uh, we ask here is, does PMDD really exist? Uh, well, according uh, to the World Health Organization, who publishes the International Statistical Classification of Diseases, the ICD, um, and as we, uh, Chloe has mentioned, the DSM, yes, PMDD does exist. And also we've heard from Laura about people with lived experience of this condition. So it looks, to me at least, it looks like PMDD does exist. And whereas the DSM is a specialist handbook published by the American Psychiatric Association, the ICD serves a broad range of uses globally and is the main basis for clinical and research communication on disorders worldwide. The ICD recognized PMDD only in 2019 and under the rubric of gynecological disorders. Why did it take so long to get this disorder recognized? And why are so many people still arguing against inclusion? Broadly, uh, probably the main argument against considering PMDD a disorder is that PMDD is a cultural bound phenomenon with a strong societal basis. Well, this argument, however, that premenstrual disorders in general are culturally bound is not supported by the wealth of study conducted worldwide on the prevalence of premenstrual syndromes and PMDD. This map here shows the, where epidemiological and survey studies on uh, premenstrual symptoms and disorders have been conducted thus far. Most of these studies here did not use prospective longitudinal monitoring and focused more on premenstrual syndrome than PMDD. However, the rates of premenstrual symptoms found in non-Western cultures in these surveys are very similar, if not higher, of those found in study using similar approaches in the West. So this looks that PMDD is not something limited to Western cultures. On the other side, the evidence for a biological component to the mechanisms underpinning PMDD is compelling. Um, Schmitz and colleagues, now almost 25 years ago, found that for some women, the normal fluctuations in estrogen and progesterone that Chloe mentioned at the beginning of this webinar, those normal fluctuations might trigger symptoms in a subgroup of women with PMDD. So these graphs show how they conducted that experiment. So the graphs on the left show uh, the response to hormones in women with PMDD and the graphs on the right are controls. So the graphs in blue here, the blue boxes show how women responded uh, to a condition to an, uh, of no hormones. So basically the um, researchers were able to manipulate the amount of hormones women were having in their blood and with how hormones, women with PMDD and controls were all doing the same. They were both doing well in terms of sadness. They were, for example, this is an example for sadness as a symptom. In the ADAPT phase of the study, so when um, the researchers introduced um, um, estrogen or progesterone in women for four weeks, those with premenstrual dysphoric disorder started experiencing symptoms while controls did not. In a subsequent study, always by the same group, um, researchers maintained those levels of estrogen and progesterone for three months. 
And during this experiment, they demonstrated that rather the constantly high concentrations of hormones, what triggers the symptoms seems to be the changes in the hormonal level. So as you can see here, the first month uh, on, on, uh, on hormones is the month with the highest rate of symptoms because the bar, the bar, this bar is higher. So the symptom, there, is, there are more symptoms that compared to months two and three. So uh, Laura, uh, this conversation always, there is a risk that it becomes really academic. And I think <laughs> more than biology, more than any study we can conduct, the important thing is that a label, a diagnosis needs to be useful for patients. How do you find the, this label of PMDD, of being a peer person with PMDD? Uh, is it useful in your experience? Um, I think it really depends on who's, who's asking you the question. Because I think sometimes um, PMDD is so little known that sometimes it's actually really unhelpful in doctor's appointments because even if I'm seeing them for something unrelated to PMDD if they ask about like you know health records or anything and I mention it then I seem to have to spend like you know two three minutes of my appointment explaining it and then another two minutes of that correcting them <laughs> about it because they don't know what it is or have false information um in terms of um speaking to peers and stuff um yeah I guess it is it's quite helpful on a personal level for me yes I think for me it was really important to have a name for what I was going through um on a personal level to know right okay I'm not imagining this this is biological there's research being done about it um there's more understanding coming of it and I think in terms of support level for me having you know that label as it were you know to be able to connect with others I think like the Facebook groups have just been amazing for me I've learned so much from them more than I have from any doctor no offense <laughs> you know but to have the time um like when I when I first joined the UK group there was only 400 people in there now it's I think it's over 10,000 but the people that stuck around in there were the ones that were knowledgeable and had done the reading and, you know, been through the system and then sort of passed their knowledge down. For me, that was really useful. Um, I think it can be difficult because it's still not so well understood that even when you're mentioning it to someone, like I said, you do still sort of find yourself explaining the condition and I'm sure to be honest I have many friends with chronic health conditions that's not just PMDD you know that you you know whatever condition you're suffering from people generally unless they're personally affected by it or closely affected by it they generally don't have a good understanding um but yeah personally for me just just having an answer to what I was going through was incredibly incredibly useful and validating and um yeah yeah <laughs> that's a long answer sorry <laughs> yeah that's brilliant thank you so going on the second um um range of questions we had was around uh, whether the response to hormonal changes is always the same it's the same for the uh, for all people and it's the same for the same person from menarche to the menopause yeah. And it's important to stress that all people are different and the same hormonal changes can trigger different responses according to the person's sensitivity. And this sensitivity can change over time. This graph here uh, is from um, uh, the guidelines of the Royal College of Obstetricians and the Gynecologists and highlights the importance of longitudinal monitoring of symptoms and shows how different profiles can emerge in different people. Not all people with premenstrual symptoms have PMDD. Most women, uh, we see, if we start looking at this graph from the left, we, we notice that most, period, most women experience, do experience mild PMS uh, symptoms, but these symptoms are not as severe as PMDD symptoms. And this echoes a bit what Laura was talking about, her experience uh, uh, at the beginning and recognizing symptoms and also the amount of time that, um, that took her um, and especially her healthcare providers to identify correctly PMDD. 
Um, women with an existing pre-mental uh, pre disorder can also experience an exacerbation of the disorder um, in the luteal phase. And this is here the third graph. So these women have, um, have some baseline symptoms of, of, of some uh, mental illness. And then on top of that, these symptoms exacerbate in the luteal phase of the menstrual cycle. And um, also women that for some reason don't have menstruations, for example, women that have undergone an hysterectomy, uh, they can still experience PMDD. And, uh, for, uh, and this is the fourth, um, the fourth um, uh, graph here. The fifth graph uh, refers to the effects that sometimes progesterone treatment can have uh, and can mimic the symptoms of, of PMDD. And finally, there are women that uh, uh, that feel that have symptoms uh, of, um, you know, like of especially mood symptoms, um, constantly more or less. They fluctuate, but they're more or less always there. Uh, but they can be recognized as more severe in the luteal phase. Of note, of all these um, different um, pictures, different manifestations, only PMDD is the only form of premenstrual disorder currently recognized by diagnostic manuals. Even within PMTT, in women uh, where people suffering from PMTT, the symptoms may occur at different points in the luteal phase and with different levels of severity. The study by Azalon Moore and colleagues, for example, had three different risk profiles. So even when we talk about PMTT, probably we should talk about PMTTs plural, and there are different subtypes that probably have different biological uh, meaning. Uh, the sensitivity to reproductive hormones might change over time. People don't necessarily experience um, PMDD with the first menstrual period. PMDD can start at any point with some women reporting a worsening of the premenstrual symptoms after giving birth or a few years before the final menstrual period um, uh, during the so-called perimenopause, Laura mentioned getting them worse with age. So really one size does not fit all here. Uh, going back to Laura, Laura, what's your experience uh, when, when you support women with a PMDD through IAPMD? Uh, do you see a lot of variation in their experiences? Yeah, we certainly see um, a lot of various variations depending on when the symptoms start. So we have parents of um, young people as young as sort of, you know, 13, 14 coming to us looking for guidance, um, trying to figure out if it could be PMDD or PME or is it just hormones is it you know just settling into sort of teenage life and, and those things going on we also see people who um, might not suffer symptoms until they start perimenopause so it appears it can be triggered at any point throughout the, the sort of reproductive life you know like you said we see people um, who don't start having symptoms until um, they've had a child or children or perhaps a miscarriage or an abortion. You know, all these things um, can potentially trigger PMDD, even though it's not entirely understood why. Um, we also see um, lots of people now, it's really interesting. So on our website, and I'm sure Sandy can share the link, we have a self-screener for people who aren't sure if they perhaps have PMDD or PME, so the premenstrual exacerbation of another disorder. So where we used to see people misdiagnosed with anything other than PMDD, we're now seeing the opposite with people being misdiagnosed with PMDD when perhaps they have the exacerbation of depression or anxiety or panic disorder or bipolar disorder. So that tracking that you mentioned is really, really key um, to really try and unpick what's going on and I mean I, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir because I should say that um, Professor De Florio runs one of the only well I think the only clinic in the UK that does differential diagnosis so that means she actually um, works with patients to actually untie those disorders and try and figure out if it is PMDD or bipolar disorder that's being exacerbated before the period um, so yes yeah, Sandy's just 
shared that self screen and that can be really really useful but yeah we see a variation we see a variation in um some people seem to suffer worse at ovulation um and then perhaps they have a break again until nearer the period we see people that it goes up at ovulation and that's it the symptoms carry right through to menstruation and then we see other people who perhaps it's only like a few days before menstruation that the symptoms really kick in so there's a real variety and it can depend on you know your age um medications you're on so many you know genetics um we did a good webinar if anyone's interested it's on our youtube channel on subtypes of pmdd and it was um dr tori eisen or moore's work um and it was really interesting where they're trying to break down those subtypes and see why people suffer from different symptoms at different points in their cycle you know are there subtypes of pmdd which is quite likely yes there is thank you laura in the next a uh, few uh, minutes, about um, five minutes, I would say, uh, we will reference suicidality. If you find it triggering or disturbing, please take a break from the webinar. Chloe showed you the symptoms of PMDD according to DSM. As you can see, suicidality, including suicidal thoughts, suicidal plans, gestures or attempts, is not considered among the symptoms of PMDD. However, the literature seems to suggest that people with PMDD are at increased risk of suicidality. Um, here are two studies about this. On the left, a study on 110 women with PMDD that found that nearly 40% of them with confirmed so prospective longitudinal PMDD diagnosis reported current suicidal ideation in the late luteal phase. This highlights the needs for better awareness and screening on suicidal ideation in women with PMDD. So I wonder, I wonder in my clinical practice, I tend always to ask, to add that question to the DSM, you know, like questionnaires and criteria. Similarly, a large survey of almost 600 people with PMDD found a very high proportion of them has experienced suicidality of self-harm uh, thoughts and behaviors in their life. How does this compare to the general population? I think um, comparisons are never easy and in this, uh, in this case are not possible because you would need a study that compares PMDD um, cases with controls in large populations. However, I'm going to to give you some context to present here the data from the English Adult Psychiatry Mobility Survey. That shows that the proportion of girls and young women reporting self-harm has increased from 2000 to 2004 to reach 20%, so one in five, and that over 12% of them has attempted suicide. So these numbers are shocking in my opinion, but still probably lower than the proportion of people with PMDD who have much higher rates of um, suicidality, according to those two surveys I've shown you. Laura, this is quite a different, a difficult topic I find. Uh, I know you were involved in the survey study on suicidality, you did a great job, and actually it's great to see stakeholders, you know, conducting research. But also um, um, uh, you and uh, uh, AIPMD have contributed to a fundraising in this area. Do you want to tell us about this? Yo, the mute, uh, the microphone. Thank there we go. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have been working with the um, Bond family. Um, primarily, actually, Sandy has been working with them. Um, unfortunately, they lost their daughter, Christina, to suicide last November, um, just three months after she found out about PMDD after suffering and being very poorly for a number of years. Um, so we worked with them. They wanted to hold a fundraiser as a um, legacy to honour Christina's life. So we worked with them for Suicide Prevention Month, uh, which was last month in September, uh, to run a fundraiser. Um, they're amazing people, amazing advocates, and they really just wanted the loss of their daughter to count for something. They're being amazing advocates. They're out there, they're talking about it, um, and they really want to raise awareness of PMDD to 
to make a difference and, and, and stop it happening because there's some interventions that can just be so simple that can work for a lot of people. Um, I think Sandy's just shared the 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 link to the the fundraiser there. So if anyone feels called to donate, please, please do please share it in any PMTD groups you're part part of. Um, the video I think is quite difficult to watch, but I think it's a really good one to share with friends and family to kind of highlight the just how severe that PMDD can get. Thank you, Laura. So given, I hope that we have persuaded you on the severity of this condition. So is there any evidence for evidence-based treatments that actually work in PMDD? And I think the evidence is there and is encouraging with an increasing number of randomized controlled trials on PMDD. Um, I'm not going to discuss any treatment in particular because I, I, I think, as I said, one size doesn't fit all. And I think these discussions should be, um, so should be, uh, you know, like, uh, we have, um, should be discussions in the clinic or personalized discussions. So, however, I'm here um, discussing, presenting five questions that I think um, you should ask yourself when you hear about treatment, somebody talks to you about treatment they recommend. And uh, what the first question is whether the studies you, you, the, that the treatment is based on were studies on premenstrual dysphoric disorder or uh, premenstrual syndromes and symptoms. We've seen that there are different um, pictures and that PMDD requires uh, prospective mood monitoring for at least two months. So you want to make sure that the treatment um, has been studied for PMDD. Then another important aspect is that you want high quality studies that usually are double blind randomized controlled trials. What does that mean? A, a randomized trial is a trial where participants are randomly allocated are given either the treatment that uh, we are testing or uh, another treatment, usually um, um, placebo is a placebo, the other option, which is basically a sugar pill. And double blind means that both the researchers and the participants to the study don't know whether they are taking the uh, pill, uh, you know, like the treatment or the sugar pill. And that is because um, in, in PMDD, but in general in psychiatric disorder, it's like, um, the uh, response to the sugar pill is quite high. So you want to make sure that your treatment is better than a sugar pill. Then uh, another important issue in, uh, in trials when you test for drugs is that you cannot account only to participants that make to the end of the trial, but you also want to make sure you know how many participants, the proportion of participants that drop out, because that might be that either the, the treatment does, didn't work for them or they had such severe side effects that they dropped out from the study. So you want to know also about that number. And of course, you want to know whether the treatment causes also side effects. And also, if you are reading about the studies, you want uh, to make sure that you are aware of any financial conflict of interest. Okay. So, uh, Laura, um, I know that um, you are publishing our guidelines books booklet for patients. Do you want to say something about it? Yeah, of course. Um, so, as you mentioned, um, and as I'm sure anyone here realizes um, who's tried seeing a doctor for PMDD, it can potentially be a, a real, real challenge. Um, so, one thing that we've worked on at IAPMD, we are um, predominantly a patient led organization. Um, what we wanted to do is build out a really, really comprehensive guidebook for patients understanding um, evidence-based treatment options. So like you say, we have experts who have gone through all those papers who know what the good, uh, good quality trials are. So patients don't have to try and do the, the work themselves to figure this out. Um, so through there, there is um, what, treatments, what treatments are recommended for PMDD. And that is based on evidence. Um, each section is broken down into how it works for PMDD, what are the side effects, 
Um, is there any scientific research that this works? How long should I try them for? Um, and what re uh, treatments are not recommended to try first? So, um, so that you are starting with the treatments that are most likely to help you. And of course, you know, it's, it's certainly not an easy thing to um, pinpoint because there is so much variation and of course the subtypes that are being studied it's likely to be to then be once the subtypes are understood then treatments will also be broken down into subtypes in the future but we're launching this ebook it's going to cost about nine pounds because it's going to be done in us dollars just to confuse things and we will be launching on the first of november so if you don't already um, follow iapmd social media please do um, or you can subscribe for our email list um, just to make sure that you don't miss it. But it's a really comprehensive guide um, to all the treatments that are recommended for PMDD. It's broken into three sections. So ones that have really, really strong um, evidence behind it, ones that have limited but promising um, research behind it and those that um, have either negative or no research behind it so hopefully it's really going to inform patients and really um, aid them to advocate for themselves and also waste less time because I think so many of us go through um, seeing doctors that haven't heard of PMDD or don't quite understand it and we waste time trying things that are likely not to work so yeah, we're really excited about launching that on the first. Thank you, Laura. This is really important. Time and money, I would say. Oh, definitely. <laughs> um, finally, the last point uh, we wanted to uh, um, share with you was um, the point of our research. And I think there is a lot um, going on to suggest really optimism. As you can see, the number of studies on PMDD uh, published uh, is increased uh, massively. So this is all good stuff. Um, in Cardiff, we are conducting the largest study uh, of PMDD today. We plan to recruit thousands of people with history of PMDD. Um, so, and to take part of the study, you don't need to experience PMDD right now, um, but you can have experienced P P uh, PMDD at any point in your life. And we need big numbers if we want to, because we want to study really individual differences with PMDD about these subtypes that um, uh, Laura was mentioning to personalize predictions and treatment as much as we can. So the main questions we, we, we are asking is like, what does make some people more likely than others to develop PMDD? Is it biology, genetics? Are there environmental factors? Is there something there about you know, stressful life events, about the way society uh, goes? Um, and what's the relationship between PMDD and other disorders, both gynecological disorders, but also other mental disorders? And we really want to help identify people at risk and provide clues into new treatments. If you want to know more about PREDICT, um, this is uh, the web page where you can find more information. I wanted just to highlight some aspects which I find particularly exciting. Um, so one thing uh, PMDD uh, does uh, was, uh, is to use uh, DNA and, and genetics. And um, I know there is a lot of talks around DNA and genetics these days, so I thought uh, I wanted to tell you why I think this is a good approach. Well, first of all, um, DNA is fixed at birth, so uh, you don't need to have, again, experienced the symptoms of the disorder you suffer at the moment in which the DNA is collected. It could have been many years previously. Uh, that is really not important because, again, it's fixed at birth. It's the same in all cells. So we don't need brain biopsies to know what's going on in the brain in terms of DNA, because it's the same in all cells of the body. And it's relatively easy to collect. For example, is uh, in this case, as you can see, it's really just about spitting in a tube and therefore it's way much, I think, less painful and annoying, for example, than a COVID test. And um, we are doing this because um, we, we, we think um, DNA can offer clues into the biology of PMDD. And uh, because of the way DNA works, it's very 
is much possible that you might have PMDD and be the only person in your family with PMDD. So a genetic component to uh, PMDD doesn't mean that all people in your family or someone else in your family needs to have PMDD. And this is because of the way DNA works. And if you go at the World Cup Collection in London, they used to display this library here. Uh, and this, uh, um, this bookshelf here uh, cont contains the DNA of a single individual. And if you open the books, the books just use for letters. And these letters are the building blocks of our genetic code, the DNA. And in this one wall library, we report again, just the code for one person. So think how many letters are in the code. Sorry. Um, now, almost, this code is almost the same for all of us. What makes us unique from a genetic perspective is the one less percent variation in the code. And we know and we think that most of the diseases, including PMDD, uh, might be caused by many variations with, more re uh, with small effects. So we really want to um, identify as these variations to provide, again, better predictions mm -hmm. and better treatments for people suffering with PMDD. Thank you. These are my acknowledgement. Of course, all people have already taken part in, in our research. Uh, wonderful Laura and Sandy here, but all the, te um, the team and the Cardiff team, the Cardiff University team and beyond, especially Chloe that's doing an amazing job and our uh, founders. Thank you. Laura, do you have any final words before question and answer? Um, no, I was just reading through the Q&A and I was just trying to put the subscribe link in the in the, the chat book. So I'm just going to do that when the... Excuse me, there we go. Excellent. So that's there. No, I think we can hop over to the Q&A. That sounds good. Um, I just answered one. Someone asked if we had any resources in the US and I did answer, but predominantly... It's really interesting because everyone in the UK thinks we're American only. So it's really interesting <laughs> to be asked that question. We're registered in America. Uh, Sandy is in Canada. I'm in UK. We have volunteers in Australia, um, Italy, Romania, uh, we're all over the place. So um, yeah, we're, we're very varied. Um, but yeah, we can start working through those questions if you like. I know we're sort of running a bit short of time. Okay, so someone's <laughs> asked if removing the ovaries is the only permanent solution to get rid of PMDD. So I have to say that many, many people find um, treatment options or interventions that work for them before that point. It's not the go-to option. It's not the only option. Um, it is, however, permanent and it's saved for those who have the most severe symptoms when it's um, really impacting them and nothing else has worked. Um, but yes, ovary removal puts you into surgical menopause. And then instead of having a hormone cycle where you're going up and down, you have levels that are created using HRT that are steady. So your brain doesn't have any of those fluctuations um, to react to. Uh, we have a fantastic um, section on the website um if you wanted to read more about it is incredibly comprehensive um if sandy could share that and someone asked if my pmdd symptoms got better or worse when the marina iud was removed and it's really hard to say because when i had it removed i was just starting on the hormone therapy so it was i don't i haven't got a yes or no answer for that one because i was just going into starting something else um but that's a difficult one to answer sorry um, I'm going to answer if that's okay, other questions about uh, the question about genetics. And many people have already done genetic testing through um, companies. Uh, can we as a UV do uh, anything with this data to help? So that, uh, thank you, first of all. And um, I think there are big consortia working on data with 23andMe. However, as you know, is a, a for-profit company so the way we interact with them uh, because we, we we don't want to share any data about our participants of course um you know like we have 
the privacy and you know the well-being of our participants at heart that might, might be challenging but this is something we, we should definitely consider and that's a wonderful suggestion thank you and regarding the the, the gene that is mentioned uh, in the question so uh, for people that don't uh, know the MPH gene um, uh, plays a role in uh, the processing of amino acids which are um, uh, building blocks of proteins and also in the chemical re reactions related to folates. However, um, this um, we think that PMDD probably is not one gene disorder, probably it's many genes. And when I see, say many genes, probably it's thousands of genes. So um, this be a candidate study, as it called, and um, we, we, we try no longer to think in terms of candidate studies, but we study the whole DNA. So millions of markers, this is why I'm saying it's a big study to conduct. So we study millions of markers and we will see, for example, if these genes come up, uh, this gene comes up, but we don't know yet. Thank it's you. Ex it's exciting because this is one bit of research I can actually get involved in even post-op. <laughs> Same genetics. It's exciting. Um, and someone just asked if PMDD was what if PMDD was considered to be a gynecological disorder rather than a mental disorder. Um, PMDD all happens in the brain. It's a brain malfunction that occurs um, when the brain reacts negatively to hormone fluctuations. So while it's triggered by ovulation, that's kind of its only connection to the, the reproductive organs. Um, it all happens in the brain and um, creates mainly um emotional symptoms so it doesn't make much sense that to be a gynecological disorder even though gynecologists do treat it by um suppressing the cycle um it kind of makes more sense to be under the psychiatric camp however there's a lot of crossover between the two and collaborative work collaborative working is kind of like the gold standard of care in PMDD that you will be working with um someone to help you through the the, the emotional and the mental type of symptoms um, and potentially along with a gynecologist working on suppressing the cycle so that you're not having those fluctuations so um yeah it's, it's a difficult one but PMDD occurs in the brain so it makes more sense Catherine, I'm aware there were people that submitted that question before the webinar. Have we answered to their questions? I don't I don't think so, haven't we? Uh, no, I sent those over to you in a list. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to say uh, to search the list. Well, um, I think there were other questions for Laura, weren't there? Yeah, I can quickly answer this one. So can you get hormone therapy while on the IUD? Yes, you can. If it's a progestin based um, IUD, such as the Marina, um, then in fact, if you are on any kind of um, estrogen therapy, you would need some progestin um, to ensure that you don't get a buildup of uterine lining in your um, uterus. So it would actually be that if you were on hormone therapy you would need either an IUD or some kind of um localized progesterone um so for example little progesterone balls that you have to pop up your vagina at night um for 10 usually 10 days a week but it, it varies per person so actually yes if you already have the IUD it's a bit of a bonus if you're going down that road already and someone's asked about the progesterone only pills i would say um that's covered quite substantially in our new ebook um the pill doesn't always um, fully suppress the cycle so it can be a bit of a difficult one it's really important to keep tracking your symptoms if you are on a treatment um just to see how that um how that correlates um but it's a good thing if if the progesterone only pill is working for you consider you know fairly consistently that's pretty good um the issue would be if that you were having symptoms the whole month round meaning you were reacting to the medication as it were fantastic thank you laura i have found <laughs> actually Catherine just sent me the questions uh, <laughs> again. So we had a question about standard pmdd and medications i hope we've answered to that um 
if whether mindfulness is useful, um, definitely some people find that useful. I don't think there is enough research on these, uh, um, you know, approaches such as mindfulness. It would be great to see uh, more research uh, on that. I would appreciate advice on explaining PMDD to healthcare professionals, peers, and employers. Um, Laura, how would you explain this? I think you, you, you spoke about this, about educating. I would say um, in terms of a patient point of view, I would go to on our website, we have a toolkit um, under the for PMDD or for patients section. There's a toolkit and there's some uh, PMDD overview view there that you can print out and take to your doctor. There's also an appointment tool, tool sheet appointment sheet that you can print out ahead of time you can write down any questions on there you can write your history um, and it has links to IAPMD so if your doctor is um, perhaps saying PMD doesn't exist or it's this or it's that then you have information just to kind of pass them it's also really important um, doctors want to see evidence-based resources they don't want to see something printed off a website that is not uh, perhaps legit so in the UK, we have RCOG guidelines. We have NICE guidelines. There's information on our website of evidence-based treatment to show your doctor. Um, so unfortunately, you have to do some of the work for a lot of the time to go in to advocate for yourself, but track your cycle, track your symptoms, have the paperwork, have it to back up. Um, yeah, and if you are struggling with that side of things, we have a peer support team, IAPMD, you can email them or um, contact them and they can help you sort of put information together to, to take to any appointments. Um, and I know someone just asked about um, psychological interventions. So CBT and DBT, um, while they haven't been researched thoroughly in terms of PMDD, DBT especially um, proves very successful for suicide reduction. Um, so that actually comes off quite highly recommended. Um, CBT as well can be really useful. I think we've answered most questions and I will leave you, you with the last one, I think, from the one we had um, before the webinar, which is how can we help our husbands understand how we feel during PMDD episodes, which I think is a great one. Um, I think that's a really good question. I think um, provide them with reading tools. There is a book coming out, I think, probably early next year um, from written by a partner of PMDD. I think that would be really useful. We also run two partner support groups where people can come along to get support from themselves and also um, gain understanding around the condition. I think... Um, I would say it's really important to kind of communicate them in your in your good days, in your good weeks, really try and get them to do as much reading as they're willing to do. Hopefully they are they are willing to do that. And um, if not, that's another issue. Um, but yeah, get them to read, 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 learn about it. And then um, there's action plans and tool sheets and things on our toolkit section that you can fill out in advance. So you could perhaps if they do something that's particularly triggering or irritating to you during that time or something that's particularly you know really unhelpful um even if perhaps they're trying to be helpful you can write it out in advance and work with them to say um you know these things in this phrase whether it's have a code word put some you know tools and resources in place before those kind of times where things tend to to blow up and, and get bad but yeah there's there's two partner support groups um both fantastic, really, really useful. And I would say, yeah, to get um, get them to go to one of those if they can, just to learn a bit more about it and, and connect with others. Because I think it's also really lonely for partners sometimes to not understand it and not understand why someone's um, suffering the way they're suffering. I That's think a long answer. <laughs> I have a final open question from uh, Irini. How does one, a teen or a young adult, distinguish between regular PMS mood swings and PMDD ones? Um, shall I try to answer? Yeah. Um, I think uh, the mood diary, again, complete having this prospective longitudinal monitoring of mood and menstruation is really, really important. And then also, the severity is quite is, a, is an important criterion and I think um, unfortunately I think it needs to go through healthcare professionals sometimes you know like 
um, showing the mudaris and discussing this with people with expertise, especially for uh, teens and young adults, I think is very important. Um, yeah. Definitely. Uh, I, I was just going to say, if you are a parent yourself, we have a parent support group on Facebook um, that can be really useful just to connect with other parents. Or if you are a healthcare professional, we just did a professional webinar on this, um, which might be really useful for you. So um, let myself or Sandy know if you are either of those and we can signpost you to the right place. I think we've answered all questions, haven't we? Yes, looks like it. Fantastic. Um, Kat, sorry, there's a couple of people have asked if these, uh, I think they're referring to the IPMD, um, the professional one that you were just mm -hmm. talking about, or if the recordings are available, which I believe they are on the... They are to members. Um, if someone particularly wants to see one, then do drop me an email, laura at iapm.org, and I will, I'm sure we can sort it out for you. Um, but they are um, currently for members only because they are a sort of very clinical audience. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, and also, Kat, I was just going to double check, the webinar today, oh, I've gone weird colours. Oh, that was good. Um, <laughs> <laughs> right, cool. Um, the webinar today, we have recorded, haven't we? And I think it's going to be on something later on. Yes, we're going to make it available um, on YouTube. So I'll be sending it out to everybody that registered, um, whether they were able to attend or not. Uh, so that should be helpful for a few people. Um, and it'll be going out on all our social medias as well. Fantastic. Cool. Thank you. Fantastic. So thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. And thank you, Laura, Sandy, oh, you're welcome. Joy and the communication team. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.